morning. You had a great night yesterday? Very good. All right. As uh, some of you know, who has been part of this ICA conference or part of our ICA tribe for some years, we usually, we have had a long-standing tradition of, uh, of having the Copenhagen Denmark lecture, which is, which is a keynote. Uh, now, thank you. Now, uh, the Copenhagen Denmark lecture um, has been a tradition for many years here, and it's something that has been impossible to do without our partners that you see up here. Uh, it's all the Danish ICA members who are, have been supporting this initiative. So we've had this Copenhagen Denmark lecture for many years. You know it's a tradition. Everybody who's met me have said, Jonas, we're looking so much forward to the Copenhagen Denmark lecture. Who is your keynote? We want the keynote. Now, there is a problem. We don't have a keynote. <laughs> so that's, that's a bit of an, an issue. We don't have a keynote this year, just to make it very clear. Uh, so I, I see many of the partners and the sponsors sitting down there saying, what, 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 what are we going to do with the money? And uh, we're going to have to have a look, a good, long, hard look at that. We'll talk about that afterwards. So we don't have a keynote. Um, we don't have a keynote. What we do have, what we do have, we have, uh, we have Jimmy. And Jimmy is, uh, is, is, uh, has, has said to me that he has something that he would like to, uh, to share with our ICA tribe. So without further ado, I'll give the, the stage to Jimmy, who will share something with us today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Is everybody comfortable? Bear with you. I just got to take off my shoes. That's a bit odd. I don't normally do this, but what I want to share with you is um, very personal. And it can get quite melodramatic, and I get a bit hot. So it's the best way. And sometimes if I leave my shoes on, like this morning I was running around here practicing, and I slipped off the stage. So I thought it's probably wisdom. Um, is everybody comfortable? Did you have a good evening? Um, we're going to begin with this. This is, uh, I suppose this is you. It's me. It's us. Uh, it's my kids. It's their friends. Essentially, it's the world. Uh, they're selfies. Um, somebody the other day told me that on average, three billion selfies have been uploaded online every day at the moment. And if you work out in my family, I've got three teenagers. Uh, they're sort of quite obnoxious, uh, amazingly beautiful, intelligent, but uh, very outspoken Amsterdam children, young adults. And they make, on average, 20 selfies of themselves every day. So in our family, we have about 60 selfies going into there. So you can imagine the air is full of pictures. Um, I think that's quite exciting in a way, because in many ways it's become the world's first sort of global language. It's all about a visual communication. And on the strength of that, I want to introduce you to a selfie of myself. It's not about vanity, because I've never been overly uh, proud of the way I look, but it was about a moment, and I think that's perhaps what selfies are. It's about a moment of reflection, a moment of objectivity, it's a moment of thought, it's a moment of time and space. And on this particular day, this was about five years ago, I remember sort of, I have to record this moment, Jimmy. You have to remind yourself never, ever, ever, ever to get into this situation again. Uh, I was depressed, <laughs> desperately. I was cold, freezing cold, about minus 40 degrees centigrade. I was lost, I was disorientated, I was homesick, and all the other adjectives that you could sort of actually pile into this moment was this moment. So it looks as if I'm smiling, but I'm actually screaming with pain, mental and physical. So I thought, recall this moment, never, ever, ever, ever get into this situation again. And what, what had happened was I was sort of very naively gone off to sort of northern Mongolia. And I sort of had this sort of dream, this dream of sort of photographing these people, the Satan. And they're a tribe of about 80. They live in the far, furthest northern reaches of central Mongolia. They're reindeer herders. There's hardly any of them left. They're extremely difficult to find. And I only know of one other person who's ever photographed them. So I sort of spent the whole of my life traveling around the world. And I thought, well, this will be OK. So I sort of wandered off to Mongolia. And I remember getting to the village at the bottom of the valley. And it's about a two-week walk. And I sort of wandered into the village, and I'd been in touch with somebody. And it was, sort of, it was my tr there was a translator. And we'd been in touch. And I said, you know, I got to go to the Satan. 
He says, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll take you, I'll take you. And we sort of came up to an agreement, as is often the case. It's going to cost a bit of money. That's fine, that's fine. But can you come with me? So I need you to come with me. So we sort of went for a walk. We went for a long walk. Yeah? It went on for days and days. And we really got to know each other. And you were speaking good English. And we got to exchange stories and everything. We went around and around. We went up and up and up and up and up and up the valley. Until eventually we got to the Saturn. There we were. Okay, we can go back to the screen now. And we got there. And there at the Saturn. There they were on top of the mountain. I was... Very excited. Okay, okay, okay. It's now. It's now. It's over to you. It's over to you. Can you talk to them? And you sort of looked at me and you sort of shook your head and said, "There's a slight problem." And I said, "Well, what do you mean there's a problem? We spent two weeks preparing for this moment of contact." And he goes, "Yeah, I, I don't quite know what to say. Um, uh, there's a problem." I said, "Well, tell me what the problem is." He said, "I don't know this dialect." I said, "You don't know this dialect? What, what are you on about?" He said, "What are we doing here? Well, why did you come all this way with me?" And he said, "Yeah, well, I, I, I needed your money." And I said, "Oh." Oh, but, but this is very complicated. I can't talk to these people. We come, we can go sit down. You don't need to stand up here all day. I said, but, but I need to talk to these people. I need to be, take their picture. I have no idea how to communicate with them. And you looked at me and said, I'm terribly sorry, but there's nothing I can do about it. It's a completely different valley. I said, but why didn't you tell me? He said, I was so ashamed. Uh. So there we are. We're miles in the middle of nowhere. You're a complete waste of time. You've run off with my money. And then with the sat down, I said, okay, I'll do it on my own. I'll, I should be okay. So I sort of remember sort of dancing around the first few days and sort of, you know, it's okay, I don't need to make any pictures straight away and it'll come, patience, patience, patience. And it didn't. And this went on for two weeks. And they're nomads and they sort of wander back and forth across the mountains. They're sort of followed by their reindeer. And I didn't make one picture. I didn't have one conversation. I didn't shake one hand. And it got pretty desperate. And, on the and eventually, after two weeks, I decided, well, I've failed. This is not actually going to work. Thanks to you, I can't communicate with them. I'm never going to be able to communicate with them. Subsequently, my journey had failed. So I gave up. And that was that moment of that selfie, this moment of utter, utter sort of failure. And uh, I remember sort of making the pitch of the light settled. And the end of the last night before the next morning when I was going to go home, walking on my own back down the valley without your help, um, we all piled into this teepee. Now, the Saturn, they had, there were about 80 of them. There were 40 each, and they both had uh, a teepee. And if you can imagine, if you've got 40 people in a teepee, it's extremely intimate. But in actual fact, it's very warm. You become like sort of human sardines, if I can sort of vaguely illustrate it. You sort of put your arms and your legs in each other's armpits and groins, and you all end up sleeping on top of each other to stay warm. But what's also very special, every evening, the old ladies, they would get out these bottles. And they would sort of pass these bottles around the tent. And in those bottles, there was a sort of homemade vodka of some kind. And I'm not very good with alcohol. So up until now, I'd abstained. I was on this mission to take my pictures and my film, and I don't want to wake up with a hangover. And, uh, but on that last night, I said, well, I'll have a sip. So I remember sitting there sort of feeling very sort of uh, dejected, and I had a sip, and it was amazing. It's sort of, uh, the best way I can describe it, it's a little bit like sort of having um, a pee in a wetsuit when you jump into cold water. I don't know, you know that feeling when you jump and you stand there, nobody knows, and you're sort of bobbing up and down. I mean, oh, this is great. And I was sort of sitting in this tent thinking, you know, this is magic. You know, why the hell hadn't I had a sip earlier? You know, life's not that bad. You know, these pictures and these films are all somewhat irrelevant. So I had another sip. And before I knew it, I got blind drunk. I mean, I was seriously drunk. But I didn't care because I had nothing to do the next day except wander down this stupid valley. Fell into a sort of alcoholic coma on the floor of the tent. I didn't feel guilty because I think most of the tent were drunk, including some of the kids. And uh, so sort of lying in there, in this sort of, as I was describing, this human sardine tin, all 40 of us sort of entwined in one another, sort of stinking of vodka. And it's minus 40 degrees. There's a blizzard outside the tent. It's cold. It's windy. But, you know, you're in this sort of alcoholic bliss. And then in the middle of the night, there's a technical problem. And then maybe some of you had this last night. I don't know. In the middle of the night, you sort of wake up and you think, oh, no, 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 no. I need to go to the loo. And, and, and it's very different than lying in a comfortable hotel room than being in a teepee at minus 40 degrees centigrade entombed in 39 in a Saturn. And I thought, well, if I get up now and I wander to the loo, I'll probably collapse and fall and maybe even be sick. Um, my tent's spinning around the wrong way, but I need to go to the toilet. I need to go to the toilet. And I thought, as is often the case when one is drunk, I'll come up, I've come up with a plan. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to become like a sort of human crab and I'm going to sort of crawl over the bodies without anybody knowing, and then I'm going to get to the side. I'm not going to go outside the tent. I'm going to lift up the side of the tent and have a bit of a pee outside, and everything will be fine. And I thought I was on my way, and I sort of got to the side of the tent, and was very happy because I turned back, and everybody was still snoring, so nobody knew the difficulties I was in. And then I made mistake number one, and as you'll find out over the next hour, I make a lot of mistakes. So I took my gloves off, and I lifted up the side of the tent. My hands froze to the tent. Slight technical problem, but I'm drunk, so it doesn't matter. There's a solution to this. So I sort of looked down. And I realized, oh dear, I've got about 10 different layers of modern clothing on. I've got buckles, Velcro, fast, and I'm sort of chained in. 
how the hell am I going to get there? And I'm sort of panicking. Because this is often the case when one needs to go to the loo. One has psychologically psyched oneself up to that moment of sort of a release. So I sort of, as I was rolling across the looking forward to this moment of emptying my bowels. And I realized when I got there, I couldn't. I couldn't get there in time. So I was panicking, hand frozen to the side of the tent. And it took about a minute, but uh, before I got to the end of the minute, the disaster struck. It was too late. I'm not going to go into detail, but it was everywhere, over me, the tent. And, uh, and uh, anyway, so I sort of look back. Everybody's still asleep. Everybody's snoring, so it's all okay. A little bit wet, it'll freeze. Doesn't matter, I'm still drunk. Roll back into my spot, empty bowel, a bit wet. Still asleep. Then something disastrous happened. Uh, about three or four minutes later, it felt like that, the whole tent started to shake. And outside the front of the tent, there were about 3,000 reindeer. For one reason or another, the reindeer decided to stampede over the tent. So, okay, it's minus 40 degrees, middle of the night, you've got a flattened tent, starts blowing up the hill, you've been trampled over by a reindeer, everybody stands up and everybody starts screaming. And I'm sort of running around thinking, what on earth is going on? It's, like, it's a bit like sort of Monty Python on steroids. This can't be true, this must be a dream. And I'm sort of standing there, one after another, the reindeer start to look at me. And as you can see, the reindeer have these sort of very tall, sort of large, very dangerous antlers on top of the head. And they start to look at me, and they slowly start coming up and walking to me, all 3,000 of them, slowly walking like this, these sort of reindeer. And in the meantime, I'm sort of thinking, this can't be true. So I'm sort of slowly walking backwards and thinking, sort of go away. And I get so far backwards, I got to the edge of this little hill that we were on, and there's a cliff back down the side. So, you're the Satan, all looking for the tent and screaming. In the middle are these 3,000 reindeer trying to lick me from head to toe, and I'm about to fall off the edge of a cliff. It's, it's a little bit of a problem. So for the very first time, I started to scream. I started screaming at the top of my head, help me, help me, help me. And they sort of eventually sort of looked through the mist, and they could see the sort of strange character about to be licked off the edge of the cliff. And they all looked at me, but they didn't come running up to help me, and they all burst out laughing. And they all sort of bent over and double, nudged each other, and they were screaming with laughter. And I'm going, help me, help me, I'm about to be licked. Get this stupid reindeer out of the way. And then eventually the chief here was on the left. He sort of wandered up, pushed the reindeer out of the way, and he came up to me, and he sort of indirectly used his hands and feet. He pointed to his groin and went, no, 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 like this. And I'm sort of, what on earth are you on about? And he says, essentially, he said, you peed your pants. And I said, I didn't do anything of the sort. You were all fast asleep. You had no idea what was happening last night. And he basically turned around and he sort of like the whole of the village started pointing to their groin, laughing with an enormous amount of laughter, and the other women coming up with bottle, more bottles of vodka. Going, what are you on about? And then all of a sudden, in a unison, they all turned around and showed me their backside. And on their backside, they had this leather pouch. And in this leather pouch, the chief took it off and shoved it under my nose. And I, I retched, and it smelt of urine. And I go, what on earth is that? And he goes, yeah, why don't you have one of these? And the whole village is slapping their backside. I'm going, one of these, one of what? You didn't show me that. He said, yeah, you didn't say you'd pee your pants. I didn't pee my pants, nothing of the sort. But just say, I had one of these leather pouches full of urine. Why on earth would I be carrying one? He goes, oh, that hadn't you noticed for the last two weeks as you've been walking with us? You must have noticed that all 3,000, the reindeer are following us across the, the hills. Why do you think they're doing that? And I said, I have no idea. He said, well, we've spent the whole day spreading the urine which we collect, because in the urine there is salt, and it's the only salt the reindeer get, and that's how they follow us all day. I said, well, thank you very much for telling me yesterday, and it was a bit late. So anyway, they sort of put up the teepee, and we all sort of crawled into the teepee, and the beauty was, this was the very first conversation, all, all about me peeing my pants. And I think the, sort of the, the irony of it was I'd spent this two weeks sort of strutting around the mountain, all my sort of outdoor gear, my cameras, waiting for this moment of contact. But it was only until I became a child, only be until there's an element of fragility, and humility in the tent of having drunk too much vodka, that a sort of, sort of contact was made. The next morning, I remember, we sort of, the sun came up, and eventually I could sort of vaguely start to communicate them what this was all about, why I was there, what I needed, what I was afraid of, the fact that I wanted to go home because I was lost, I was disorientated, I was afraid, and I was unable to do what I'd set out to do. And eventually, we started to make a form of communication, a very basic communication, but a communication that came from an element of humility and fragility. And then that story, and then many, many years later, I'm essentially doing the same today. Here are 35 different tribes from around the world. And I've been sort of traveling for many, many years, making contact with them. Why uh, I have to go back a lot in time, and that's to here. And this, is sort of, uh, this was only until a couple of years ago. I didn't realize this is what it was all about. My wife sort of came up to me very brashly and put a mirror in front of my face and said, Jimmy, have you ever thought why you go on such extreme journeys? And I think this has to do with it. This is me as a child. I was seven years old. My father worked for Shell, 
and I traveled extensively around the world with them. And at the age of seven, they said, okay, Jimmy, you've got to go off to a boarding school. There's no suitable education for you here. And so off I went. I ended up at the age of seven going to a school with about 1,000 boys and 400 Jesuit priests on top of a mountain behind a wall. It's a little bit like Harry Potter, but with no magic. Just other things going on behind the wall which shouldn't have been going on behind the wall. So in a strange way, you sort of grew up in a, with an odd, um, ex odd experiences. And then I got to the age of 16 and uh, uh, came back from a vacation in uh, Central Africa. And I was ill. I had cerebral malaria. And I arrived back at this, uh, I, I didn't actually want to leave home. And I remember saying to my parents, they said, well, can't you just uh, keep me here? I'm really ill. And they said, well, no, we don't really know how to do that. You've spent the last umpteen years going backwards and forwards to those priests. They'll look after you far better than we can. So I think I was a com com combination of being very stressed, uh, lonely, and, uh, and ill. So I arrived back at this boarding school with cerebral malaria. And one of these very friendly priests, they were always very friendly, said, oh, it's fine, Jimmy. We're going to give you a pot of pills. Gave me a pot of pills. I went to bed and I woke up the next morning. This is the way I ended up looking. Uh, all my hair fell out. Uh, it's called alopecia totalis. And as my kids say, Dad, you don't have to talk about that story now. You're just getting old. Half of Amsterdam has no hair. I know, I know. But when you're 16 and you wake up in the, in the morning, you look in the mirror and you meet somebody else, it's somewhat intimidating. And the only way I s could imagine solving it, and there were sort of many sort of dances in between, was running away. And I remember, this is where the science comes into it. I remember Tintin. I'm sure many of you read Tintin when you were younger. And I remember uh, meeting Tintin on his journeys through Tibet. And he spent a lot of time with lots of little ball boys running in and out of monasteries. So at the age of 17, I bought a one-way ticket to Tibet. And I walked the length of Tibet for a period of about one and a half years, dressed as a monk. I wasn't in search of the Dalai Lama. I didn't even know who he was, to be honest. I didn't even know what Buddhism was, purely on the inspiration of Tintin. I decided to go and find myself. Whether I necessarily found myself or not, I'm not sure, but I did take a camera with me. And that camera enabled me to end up doing what I do today. And this is a book I published about three years ago. And after 30 years of discovery, of self-exploration, of asking who am I, where do I fit, how do you see me, how do I see you, it ended up in this sort of compilation of pictures of these 35 tribes, which I showed you a few minutes ago. And something quite exciting happened. I'd never really sort of put any sort of thought into what I was doing other than I want to make contact. I, I want to make contact with myself and I want to make contact with others. The book was published and it, was, it became essentially a success. I think about 7,000 publications published the pictures over a period of about a year. And then the whole world media started coming to me. I had no experience with the media and they said, oh, Jimmy, amazing, amazing pictures, amazing stories, amazing books. And then they said, oh, but, but are they, is it true what you do? And I said, what do you mean is it true what I do? It's fake. These people aren't real. They can't tr tr exist. And I said, well, what do you mean? Of course they exist. This is the way I see the world. It's spectacular. They're icons. They're extraordinary. They're rich. They're glorious. And people started saying, no, 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 they're not. And then people started to criticize me in quite a substantial way. We had a verging on a court case with Facebook accusing me of tribal pornography, which I thought was somewhat sort of ironic. And then it got even further. There was this one particular individual saying, Jimmy Nelson's wrong-headed obsession with vanishing indigenous cultures. This is a little bit what I want to discuss with you this morning with the illustration of a few stories. But the very first story is very, very simple. Everybody always asks me, said, Jimmy, how, if you, other than peeing your pants on every journey, how on earth do you make contact? Because you don't speak any of the languages. So for this, I need somebody's help. So I'm going to come into the audience. Like, Can you come with me? You're today, you're today's cannibal. OK, oh, tup, 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 tup. OK, you're going to come in. Who, what's your name? Annie. Annie, OK, Annie, great. I'm, I run into Annie's village. Annie's here. Annie's with all her friends. They're a little bit intimidated by me, and they're scared. So I, the very first thing I have to do is get on my knees. I have to make myself as small as possible. And the best way I can sort of describe this is a sort of combination of being a dog and Mr. Bean. <laughs> And, you know, whichever airline you go on in the world, you come across Mr. Bean, and you see what he's doing. Everybody laughs at what he's doing because he's been very vulnerable. He's been very emotional. He doesn't use any words, but an awful lot of physicality and ultimately humility and failure. So the very first thing I have to do is fail. I have to make myself as small and as terrified as possible. So you're standing there, and you're angry with me, and you're pushing me, and you're shouting at me. All your friends are there, and you start kiss kicking me, not kissing me, excuse me. That was, uh, that, was, uh, that was last night, no. Um, you start kicking me. Kicking me, yes, just, we're, we're all the same. You start kicking me and uh, pushing me, and, and often I end up crying. And I'm sort of sitting there, and, you're, and then a bit of, what invariably happens very, very quickly, you won. 
That's the whole idea. And because I'm very small and I'm not a threat, and then you get bored, and then everybody sort of walks away. But on this particular day, you're staying behind because you're sort of curious, what on earth is this strange guy doing on the floor? And I'm sort of sitting there looking up at you. And eventually, when everything's calmed down a bit, I sort of sidle up to you a little bit like a dog or a cat. And I touch you and go, oh, wow, you're amazing. Oh, look, wow, look, oh, you're incredible. Oh, you're so strong. Wow, if you stand like that, oh, wait, just stay there. Okay, oh, on these feathers on your head, incredible. Wait, 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 lift you, stay there, stay there, stay there. And always keeping small. And they say, look, 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 look. Look in, my, look in my box here. I need another picture on the wall. Here we go. Another picture. Go from the screen. And then in my box, I've got this very old plate camera. It's very deliberate, and I'll talk about that in a minute. You start building it and putting it on the tripod. And I'm looking through, and I'm coming backwards and forwards the whole time. But it's very, very difficult to use. It's very, very cumbersome, hot, and I'm sweating. You look amazing, amazing, amazing like this. And then after a while, I've got it all set up, and everything's ready and pack up straight. Muscles like this, yeah, super hair, a lot of great, beautiful, like that, wait, 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 wait. And then I get the camera and I'm ready and I read the light and go, there's not enough light. Oh, I need help. So all the villagers that were a few hours ago kicking me and spitting at me, I run off. Stay there, don't run away. I run back off into the village. I need your help. Come, 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 quick, before the light goes. I need quickly, up, 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 up. I need four of you, quick. So I take you back onto the stage. Oop. And then I need, you see the lights up here, you're the chief, you see, I'm going to give you a reflector, you see the light there, you've got to bang the light on the head, you don't move, stay where you are, stay, that's it, go like that, you stay there, don't move, concentrate, you've got to get the light, you, you've got to come down here, go quick, 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 down, lo, 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 lo. you see the shadow there, you see the shadow, bang like that, and you get a give that, and then you, you come up here, you're my assistant, okay, you hold that, get down there, get down, oh, I need some water as well, oh, blub, 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 blub. yeah, okay, ready, Hold on. Everybody concentrate, don't move. Now I need you, come here. Whoop, 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 whoop. You've got to come down here. Whoop. Jump, 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 jump. And you see there's a little bit of light up there, and you're going to get this big gold reflector, and boom, there. Okay. Okay. And then everybody's ready, and you're looking, you're looking. You're ready? Okay. Shh, right, don't move, don't laugh. Right, straight, straight. Handsome, that's it. Okay. You get back down, you get back down, you look into the light, and this has taken half an hour, and the sun has moved. Uh -huh. sun is, the sun's moved. So you come back up. There, 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 there. Concentrate. No, no, get down, get down. I haven't finished yet. I haven't made the picture. Okay, ready? The sun's moved. You, and even though you're far away, I'm watching you, okay? Okay, and everybody goes, okay, we can get back down, okay? Okay, concentrate. And then I need five seconds for the picture because it's an old sheet of film with a very, very slow eyes. Shh. Breathe in through your nose, yeah. Brow, chest out, okay. Shh. And then I put the film in. I count to five. One, two, three. Four, five. And if you don't move and everything's like, yeah, it's amazing, we got the picture, thank you, thank you, thank you. And invariably you bounce going, <laughs> like, but then what gets very exciting is you stand up and you, say, and you say, I'm far more important than this one, it's my turn. I'm gonna stand up, I've got even bigger muscles. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And I go, all right, well look at you, you go and stand over there with the reflect. We will have a go, well done, well done. And this whole process goes on and on and on until you photograph the whole village. Next picture, thank you, you can all sit down. <sighs> And then, don't run away. Okay, thank you, thank you. And then when the picture's finished, you've collapsed. And the next morning, you come back up to me. And the beauty of having a name like Jimmy is, I <laughs> I've discovered wherever you are in the world, everybody can say it. And you come running up to me, Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. And I, yeah, what is it now? And you take me to the edge of the village and you point off into the distance. Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. And there's a whole new village that's come from another valley. Because they've heard this crazy bull guy spends all day on his knees going, you're amazing, you're amazing. <laughs> Go sit down. And then this whole sort of dance goes on for essentially weeks. But it is a way of making contact. It's not, it's not no great philosophy. But it's a way of seeing them. It's a way of me seeing them and them seeing me and seeing me in my passion and my eccentricity to put them on a pedestal, to make them icons, to make them beautiful. Although I don't necessarily know what photography is. And then it gets exciting. A sip of water. This is in Papua New Guinea. This is with the Huli Wigmen. And uh, I spent a couple of weeks in their village photographing them. And then I think, wow, when I walked to their village, I came across this beautiful waterfall. Wouldn't it be amazing to get them in the waterfall, to put them into context, to show you how they live, to show you in all their glory, to show you in the environment, to essentially show you that they are like Avatar, that there are places on the planet still today that are truly pristine in their culture, in their nature, and that's here. But this can sometimes take days and days and days, but the thrill of getting them to follow you, the thrill of saying, come and wait here, and if you get it right, you end up with something like this. And it's just, it's just, it's just a picture. 
Again, it's just a picture, it's a two-dimensional moment, and to be honest, the thrill of making it is sometimes more exciting than actually looking at it. But it, it's, it's a composition, it's an artistic composition of power, of strength, of iconography, of wealth, of true beauty of some of the world's last and most extraordinary indigenous peoples. And then you've got another journey. This is very odd. Have any of you been to Chukotka? Uh, okay, Chukotka is sort of the remote. It's, it's as far as you can go off the map in Siberia. Here's a little film. This is an amazing story. This. Siberia, and there's nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing, as far as the eye can see. But it's so beautiful. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> and cold. I don't quite know, quite know what's happened here. It looks like there's been a plane crash. It's incredible. It left over some old illusion stuck in this sort of uh, Arctic tundra. Okay, this is Chukotka. Um, in Chukotka live the Chukchis. And the Chukchis, again, in this sort of very sort of Tintin esque, sort of uh, uh, Mr. Bean esque, uh, whatever way you describe are some of the last sort of Eskimos, the es sort of indigenous people that live and look like Eskimos. And surely in the Northern Hemisphere, there are many, many tens of hundreds of thousands of people that live in that environment, but very few of them that look in this sort of iconographic way, except in Chukotka. And I'd met somebody online uh, about four years prior to going, and he was a Chukchi, and he said, yeah, come, I'll help you find them. It sh it'll be okay. And I eventually arrived, and I remember arriving at the airport. This is true, it is very bizarre. And he was sort of sitting there waiting, and I came running up to him as I often do. He said, oh, it's great, I'm here, I've got about two weeks to get there. And he sort of looked at him, and he goes, two weeks? That's a bit tight, isn't it? And I said, yeah, but we were discussing, you know, I've got the schedule, and he goes, two weeks? What do you mean, two weeks? And I said, well, I've got two weeks to go and find the Chukchis. And he goes, well, that's going to be a bit of a problem. I go, well, what do you mean that's a problem? He goes, yeah, well, um, I don't know where they are. I said, you don't know where they are? We spent four years online communicating. You knew I was coming. I've got this schedule. And he goes, yeah, but they're nomads. And I said, yeah, of course they're nomads. I've just come from you know, Papua New Guinea, and everybody's moving around the jungle there, and I found them. Surely I'll find the Chukchis. And he goes, yeah, there's only about 80 of them, and they're split into two brigades, and they move. I said, yeah, but well, what do you mean they move? Yeah, well, the area of Chukotka is the size of France. The size of France. Yeah, well, contact them. He says, they don't have any contact. They don't have any telephones. They don't have anything. But he says, I've got a very good idea how we can find them. My brother has a tank. It's called a Tundra tank, and it goes about 10 kilometers an hour. And he's very proud because he's just installed a new petrol tank on the roof. It takes two months' worth of diesel. Two months? Two months of diesel? Well, what do you mean two months? He says, well, we may need those two months to find them. I said, you can't be serious. I'm not going to come with you sitting in a tank crossing Siberia for two months in, in indiscriminate. He said, well, that's the only way we may find them. And I said, well, if we do go, how are we going to find them? And he goes, oh, that's very easy. They're reindeer herders. And I suddenly got very upset with that, and he didn't really know my history with reindeer. And, uh, and he sort of looked at me and I said, oh, I'll talk to you about that later. And I said, yeah, I have this thing with reindeer. But um, he goes, well, they're reindeer herders. And uh, what I can do is I can track where they are by the age and the distribution of their reindeer droppings. Interesting. So, um, as you can see by the pictures I made, we started the journey. And the journey went on. I ended up sitting for, this is Bram, the cameraman who came with me, for 28 days in this tank. 28 days. Some of those days we sat in a whiteout for about 48 hours, and we just dribbled across the ice. It's bizarre. On day three, Bram sat on my iPhone, I remember, so all my films, my music, and my books disappeared. So for a period of about 24 days, I sat and thought in this sort of metal dentist chair, going at 10 kilometers an hour across the sort of sea of ice and minus 40 degrees centigrade. But on day 28, we were coming over these mountains, and in the distance, here's the tank, in the distance we saw something which felt, the best way I can describe it, is a bit like arriving in Manhattan. There was a tent on the horizon, and it's very exciting. So, you know, you can have met me now for the last half an hour, bouncing up and down on the stage, having spent 28 days in a tank. I was kind of excited. So I came down to this tent, and outside the tent there was this picnic. I'm going to come to this side now. And they were sort of sitting in minus 40 degrees around this sort of op open little fire. And I thought, well, there's no time for introductions, all sort of vanity, all sort of running. I've got to take these pictures. And in the mint, there was this chief sitting there, and he was beautiful. And I sort of ran up to him, said, oh, my name's Jimmy. I've just been in this tank for 20 days. I've got to get back. I'm late. I'm late. Just sit still. I'm going to make a picture, and I'm going to go. He said, all right. And he sort of looked at me. 
And everybody looked at me, and the whole of the picnic leaned in, and they, he looked at me, and he raised his finger, and he spoke the one word of Russian I knew, and he went, Nyet. <laughs> and I went, what, what do you mean, Nyet? Uh, what do you mean, Nyet? Uh, and he says, Nyet, and the whole of the village went, Nyet, 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 Nyet. <laughs> and I looked at the chukch, and I said, but, 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 I'm here, I'm Jimmy, I'm doing this project, it's important, iconography, all these pictures, life's 28, I've got to get home, I've got to get home. And he goes, Nyet. And I looked at the trying and I said, what's this on about? Hey, I'm not going to steal your soul or anything. You know, it's very, very, very tame. And he goes, it has nothing to do with our soul. It has to do with there's no time. We're not going to sit still. We've been filmed before. We've been photographed before. But if you've noticed, it's minus 40 degrees centigrade here. We can't sit still waiting for you to make these pictures and these films. But he said, we would be very happy if you stay. And I remember this moment of sort of objectivity. Stay? Well, what am I going to do then? if I can't make pictures. And he said, well, that's why you, you came to meet us. You came to see us. You came to, to live with us. You came to participate in our lives. And I said, yeah, but I'm here to make pictures. He goes, yeah, but, but isn't that what it's about? It's about a connection. And then, for the, it's very strange, because it's only about three, three and a half years ago. After all these years, you're confronted by th something very, very profound. And I said, well, but I can't make a picture. He said, but it's not about the picture. It's about us. It's about you and me and about making contact. So in a strange sort of semi, uh, sort of creative masochistic way, my hands were t handcuffed, my cameras didn't come out. For the next two weeks, after having spent a month in a tank, we lived with them. But those two weeks were glorious, and I could spend the whole day telling you what happened in those two weeks, and I won't, other than to say we made a contact that went beyond a contact that I've ever made before, because we lived with them, we held them, we participated with them, we survived with them. They kept us alive as we kept them alive. And at the very end of the trip, on the last evening, they sort of, for the pictures you see were made in a period of two hours, they said, you can make some pictures. And then we were sort of sitting around in the tent, and, and I asked them, I said, well, what are you doing here? We'd had this very extraordinary, uh, intimate two weeks. I said, you know, you're intelligent. What, what are you doing here with the 40 of you stuck on the edge of the world in this tent? He said, well, we've actually chosen to be here. I said, how, how can anybody choose to live in such a harsh isolation? He said, well, this is where we lived not so long ago. We lived in this block of flats. I said, block of life. I said, well, I'll tell you a story. Three years ago, and a bureaucrat came to us, and they said, oh, the Chukchis, oh, you're lovely, you're marvelous, we're extremely proud, but you know, the time has moved on. We don't need you to be an indigenous culture or a tribe living on the ice anymore. But we're so proud of you, we're going to sponsor you, we're going to move you to these flats, we're going to subsidize you, and you're so special, you don't have to do anything. We're going to give you everything for free. And they had no objectivity, they abandoned everything, and they moved to these flats, all 80 of them. Then after six months, that same bureaucrat came back and he told me that he said it was magnificent. He came running up to him and he goes, oh, you look as if you've changed. And the Chukchi says, well, 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 you feel very different. He says, you know, you look very unhappy. And the Chukchi turned around to me and said, we didn't know what unhappy was. It wasn't part of our dictionary. He goes, what is unhappy? And he says, it's as if your soul has left your body. You've become a completely different human being. And the Chukchi turned around and said, well, we, this happy, unhappy, we don't know what it means, but you're right. We feel very, very uncomfortable. To all intents and purposes, yes, we feel very unhappy. And the bureaucrat says, well, how are we going to solve this then? And the Chukchi turned around and said, you know, then we'll go back to where we were happy. And that's where I met them. And he explained to me, he said, we remember we had the, when the bureaucrat left that evening, we sat around and we said, what are we going to do? And every single one of the 80 Chukchis said, if we had a choice, two choices, one, either one more day of our life living in a tent on the ice in minus 40 degrees, but with one another, close to the environment, close to one another, close to our culture, or the rest of our lives in this concrete purgatory, we would choose that one day. And that's where they went back to. Now, traveling back in the tank after that story that evening, I sort of thought, you know, what are they trying to say to me? Do I have to sort of take off my clothes and dress myself in fur and run across the ice? No. What they were saying, though, is they were one of the few people left still on the planet who were truly, truly in touch with themselves, truly in touch with their heritage, their culture, their nature, everything that they stand for as human beings. And in that, they could make a choice. They could make one of the most extraordinary choices that I'd ever seen. So what it taught me was that coming back to this environment, the developed world where I live, I live in Amsterdam, much the same as you in a, in a city, um, if you are in touch with yourself, you can make some of the most profound choices that you ever knew. So that excuse saying you can't do this, you can't do that, is a load of rubbish. You have to be very, 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 very connected, much the same as the Chukchi were. Last story along these lines. This is a little bit melodramatic. This is uh, northwestern Mongolia. Beautiful part of the world, extremely photogenic, very kind, very decent. Very uh, warm, handsome, powerful people. So this whole dance of taking these portraits went on for a few weeks. 
then I remember sort of arriving with the Kazakhs, and um, they, they have this beautiful tradition. As you can see, they have these eagles. And when, like most of these tribes, when children leave their, uh, pub during their puberty, becoming a man, they're here they're, they're encouraged to climb cliffs. And whilst climbing a cliff, they get these baby eagles, and they spend the rest of their lives living with these baby eagles. They sometimes, they end up being 30 kilos, they have five meter wingspans, and they travel and they hunt across these extraordinary landscapes. And I remember very thinking, I have to get some of these Kazakhs on top of the mountain. It'll be extraordinary. So I started taking these portraits and running down to the village, saying, tomorrow, come on, we're going to go up on top of the mountain. The same sort of song and dance. And they looked at me and they said, but it's cold and it's windy. Yeah, but we've got to be up there when the light rises in the morning. And the, the next morning, we sort of walked up. It's a three-hour walk. We set off in the dark, and we're standing on top of the mountain. It's windy, it's blowing. It's about minus 20, but it's potentially beautiful. And slowly as the sun rises, but it doesn't rise. And everybody's lined up, and everybody's ready for the picture. And I've got this old camera all lined up. And it's gray, and it's dark. And I think, but this isn't the picture I wanted to make. It doesn't have the depth. It doesn't have the beauty. So I said, we're going to go. We'll come back up again tomorrow. So we sort of walk down the mountain. And they look at me and say, we're not going anywhere tomorrow morning. We're lying in. Oh, please, please. And the next day, come on, you've got to come. I didn't make the picture. This is what it's about. So the next morning, I said, drag them reluctantly up, sat them on top of the mountain. And again, the same process. It's very gray, it's very dark, and I think, this can't be it. And then you have this sort of moment of object. You think, well, maybe I should just make the picture, sort of make it digitally, paste it in the sky later, turn up the contrast, nobody will know, you know. And then I think, no, 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 I want to make it on this platform. I want to make that one-off, that one, one image, a focus of concentration of composition. So we went down. This time they said, we're not coming anywhere with you tomorrow morning. So I spent the whole day, oh, you've got to come. So the next morning I dragged them up on top of the mountain. You're coming with me. A little bit brutal. So there they sort of lined them up, sort of pulled them up on top of the mountain. Everybody's sort of standing there and stands still. And they sort of go, we don't want to be high. No, but look, look, the sun's going to rise. The sun's going. So this is going to happen. It's going to happen. So everybody's lined up. The white horse is in the middle and everything's blowing and it's beautiful. So you're sitting up, so and I get up the camera, and everything's ready. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And then I get a little bit excited and look through the camera. And say, oh, I've got the wrong lens on. Wait, 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 wait. So I sort of remember taking off my gloves, fiddling with the lens, but the lens is attached to a metal plate. And in the process, my finger stuck to the metal plate because it had been sort of in the, in the cold wind for about half an hour. And you're sort of looking at me, and I have this sort of moment, a real sort of Mr. Bean-esque moment of being stuck to this camera. And he's going, come on, after three more, he's making the fucking picture. And I said, I can't, I'm stuck to the camera. I'm stuck to the camera. And they're sort of looking at me and go, oh, no, this guy's insane. I can't. He said, well, take your fingers off the camera. I can't, they're stuck. So I sort of eventually took my fingers off, and I left all the skin behind. You can go sit down. And, and it's okay, because I'm not going to do anything with my bleeding fingers. And I remember sort of taking my fingers off, and they started to bleed, and it's like somebody sort of hitting them with a hammer. And they began to seriously hurt. And then I remember sitting down, and I started to sob. And it wasn't so much the pain, but it was the realization that I was truly eccentric. And uh, autistic, as my wife sometimes claims, and many, many other adjectives, but we won't go into that now. And I thought, what's this all about? Why do I go to such an extreme? There are 10 times easier ways to go through this process. I need a picture now. And sitting there, and then all of a sudden, one of the colors, he looked behind me, and he said, look, 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 look behind you. And I sort of looked behind me, and these two, not this lady, but these two very large, very beautiful, handsome Mongolian women sort of wandered up to me like this, and they were sort of grumbling. And one of them opened her jacket, and she grabbed my hands, can you hold that a minute? And grabbed my hands and put them on her chest like this. And I sort of subsequently sort of fell into her like this. The other lady came behind me and she grabbed me and they hugged me so tight, my legs buckled from and I'm sure I was hanging in between these two Mongolian women. And I cried even more, but that was for other reasons than the pain in my fingers. And they start sort of singing these songs, sort of singing, and I'm sort of sobbing away. And then this, I think, what four or five minutes, and then eventually I sort of thought, hey. I feel my fingers again, and sort of the element of autism sort of returned, picture, picture, picture. So I sort of pushed these women away, very unpolite of me, and sort of wandered back to the camera, threw the one sheet in the camera, and made the picture which you just saw. And I was wandering back down the mountain, and then this sort of moment of realization, I don't have that many, but this is one of those moments where I thought, well, this is perhaps what it's all about. The Kazakhs are Muslims. Uh, they're very uh, gentle Muslims, but they are Muslims. I spent a long period of my childhood living in the Middle East, so I know what it means. Firstly, you invariably don't see any of the women. Secondly, there's no way in a million years that any of the men would encourage you to look at their women. Thirdly, the women themselves would not open their jacket and put your bleeding hands all over their breasts, armpits, breasts. Fourthly, they wouldn't give you a bear hug for a period of four minutes and sing sweet songs, lullabies into your ear, especially in my state. I'm sure what happened at this moment on that mountain is what I've been looking for for all these years. It was a moment of 
complete and lack of utter judgment of how I looked, how I smelt, what I believed in, what my intentions were, I'd failed as a human being. I was utterly, utterly vulnerable and fallible on that mountain in my eccentricity, taking these stupid pictures of mine, and they decided to help me. And I'm sure that's the contact that invariably I've been looking for all these years. So it's not about the pictures, it's about human beings seeing one another in the most extreme ways possible. And this was a few weeks later. Uh, and then it gets addictive. It gets very exciting. It goes from one mountain range until the next, with one group of Kazakhs to the next. <laughs> it's so beautiful there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Pictures made, a book published, and then whilst I was sort of being interviewed by uh, umpteen dozen people, I kept saying, there's something that hasn't happened yet. I haven't completed the circle. And people saying, what circle? I said, well, most of the people I photographed never saw what I was doing. They said, what do you mean they didn't see what you're doing? I said, I'm making the pictures on this plate film. I have to go back. I have to show the people what I'm doing. I have to complete that circle of communication. So I started to be invited back. And one of the first journeys, we're making a documentary at the moment, and this is part of it. I went back to northern Namibia, to the Himba, uh, on the border of Angola. Now, the, the Himba have been photographed before. They've been filmed before by many people. Um, but there's very, very few of them left. There's only about 0.1% of their population left living in this, this sort of glorious sort of desert. And I remember sort of arriving back, and I didn't necessarily arrive in a hot air balloon. That was the production value, but uh, I eventually did arrive. And something happened. They looked at me, and they all started screaming. And I sort of felt very, I thought, oh, no, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? And they came, up, run, they came running up to me and said, oh, it's Jimmy, 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 which is extraordinary after four years. They remember my name and they said, oh, you have no idea, you have no idea. Many people have filmed us before, many people have photographed us before, but nobody has ever, ever, ever bothered to come back and show us what they took from us. It's not about that I took your soul or your identity, but you, you took a conversation. We want a conversation with you. We want to discuss what you see in us. We want to discuss your perspective. We want to ask you who we should become. Should we stay here? living in the desert like this, or should we go with the rest of the population to the city? What's it all about? Why, do you make, why are people interested in the way we look? We have nothing, or do we have everything? And this ex beautiful conversation started. And then I remember sort of showing them the book and immediately seeing their pride and their eyes lighting up and pointing, there we are, there we are, there we are, and then having this magnificent discussion when we got to the end of the chapter of the Himba. And we got to the Chukchi, and oh, who are these? And I said, well, these are the Chukchi. They're another glorious tribe, another glorious culture, miles and miles away, but as special and as rich as you. And then after the Himba, we went to, uh, I went to Vanuatu, a group of islands in the Pacific. I'm sure some of you know where they are. There's 83 of them. And the southernmost island is the island of Tana. And I was invited by a CNN crew, which was a little bit sort of odd. And uh, this guy around me said, hi, my name's Bob. Where would you like to go, Jimmy? I said, well, I'd love to go. I sort of thought of their production value. I'd love to go to Vanuatu, actually. Well, we'll take you. Let's meet you in Sydney. So I sort of flew down to Sydney, and there were six very large bobs standing there with 83 different drones and rigs. And I thought, well, this is not necessarily going to work with these very delicate, very beautiful people on this island of Tana. But we went. And the same process, I sort of took the book, and um, to begin with, all these sort of Americans, excuse me, the Americans in the audience, running around, oh, Jimmy, it's amazing. They're all naked. I said, I know, I know. That's part of what it's about. It'd be a little bit more sensitive, please. And at the, towards the end of the journey, once everything sort of calmed down, we got used to the fact that most of the people weren't wearing any clothes. Um, the chief said, you know, you have to come and sit with me in the tree. We have to make a picture of you. Uh, and I'd taken the book back with me. And I was, it was a very, very, very proud moment. And I remember sort of sitting in the tree. Here I am with this book and uh, sitting under the tree. And the chief sort of looked at me and he goes, but there's a problem. 
And I said, well, what's the problem? I've come all the way halfway across the world with this book. And he goes, yeah, I'm very happy with the book, but uh, there's a real problem with the rest of the village. And I go, oh, no, I've done it now. What have I done now? And he goes, yeah, when will the village get their book? So I said, what? So all 80 of the villagers hanging in the banyan tree were waiting for a book as well. So if anybody wants to come on a journey, if anybody's got nothing to do next year and needs to come on a boat with me with 83 books, please. I'm now going to take you to uh, another tribe. Uh, this is probably the most important tribe of the lot. Uh, it's where often I'm making even bigger mistakes with at the moment, let alone sort of not giving the whole tribe a book. It's my family. Uh, I have, at the moment, I have three teenagers, 19, 17, and 15. When they were smaller, they followed me, and I, I could pretend to be the boss and the leader, and my wife said, you know, you, you can stand on a pedestal and it, laughing behind my back. And I took a, took a lot of pictures of them, put them on elephants, and did whatever I could do to make them look uh, interesting. And then time started to change. They sort of entered puberty, and they started to grow. And then this is my son. This is my son about half a year ago. He's now 17. And uh, he got to a stage where he stopped liking me, uh, so he said. And he said, well, you have no idea who I am. You're never here. And uh, um, I think you're a bit of an arsehole, was the last thing I heard from him in the six months ago. And I will thank you. We were on holiday, and my wife sort of came up to me. And this is a true story. She said, oh, Jimmy, um, do you mind? I'm going to stay on holiday when the holiday. I said, what do you mean stay on holiday? I'm doing this project. I've got to go to Chicago. She said, yeah, no, but you've been traveling around the world, you know, contacting, finding yourself with all these tribes. I'm going to go on a yoga course because I'm kind of out of balance as well. And I said, what's a yoga course? What do you mean? I'm busy. I'm, I'm, imp I'm important doing this project. And she goes, well, it's probably even more important. You go back home with the kids. You can pretend to be the boss in the house. I won't be there to interfere. You know, whatever you do, they'll listen to. But it's time you reconnect with them. So I'm off. So she sort of disappeared off with two very handsome men in sort of white suits, lighting candles off over the rise. Uh, I sort of wasn't overly amused, but obviously didn't have any choice. And I sort of sheepishly went back home with the kids. My son was not in contact with me. And on day two, I sort of came across my younger daughter, an exceptionally smart young lady, and she says, uh, you're struggling, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I know. Where is he? And she says, well, he, he really doesn't like it. I said, I know he doesn't, but help. And she says, I've got an idea. Um, he wants a new bedroom, maybe. And he, he says he's become a little bit of a goth. Goth, what do you mean goth? He wants it all black. He wants to get rid of the color. You know, he wants it to be a bit tougher. Maybe if we all go shopping in Ikea tonight, we'll get something to eat. And you can buy something. That's a way of connecting with him. I said, but where is he? She said, I'll, I'll organize that he turns up in the car. Don't worry. You know, don't push it straight away. So that night, I was, I was sitting in the car in front of the house, and he sort of turned up with his headphones on and his hat on and playing a game on his telephone. He got in the back and wasn't that much contact. But I thought, you know, one step at a time. He's in the car. We drove off to Ikea. And... Uh, Half an hour into a care, he came running up to me and he said, you know, you really are, last time, you really are an arsehole. I said, what, you think you can buy me by taking me shopping here, but you have no idea what we look at all this stupid color around me. I want black. And he sort of disappeared off into the shadows. And I had a sort of a Mongolian mountain moment with frozen fingers. Sort of mid and I sort of sat down on a Thursday evening thinking, oh, no, is this what my life's become? You know, nobody listening to me. And my daughter came up. She said, Dad, you know, you, you've got a real problem. I said, I know I have. She said, no, 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 it's a problem we can solve. He said, you've lost all your sense of humor. I said, what do you mean my sense of humor? He said, I've got an idea. Do you remember when we were small kids and we used to play with you and we used to stick things on your bald head and we used to knock them around and have a really good laugh and you found that funny? He said, yeah, look what I found. I found these sort of toilet brushes <laughs> with these suckers on the end. And I said, yeah, but what on earth does that have to do with me? He said, well, if I rip the bottom and stick it on your head, you could end up looking like this. And I remember sort of sitting there, literally, and this is true, sitting there six months ago, sitting in a care on a Thursday evening with 20 different brushes stuck to my head and unaware of the fact that I looked like the sort of contemporary tribal leader. Uh, on the, I, I looked as if I was smiling again, but remind, remembering that selfie at the beginning, I was actually crying at this stage out of utter, utter self-pity. And magic happened. My son came out of the shadows and he looked at me and went, wow, that's cool. <laughs> Got out his iPhone and took a picture and ran off back into the shadows. Two days later, still no contact with him. I was working in my study late at night. My wife's still doing yoga, or so she claimed. <laughs> the door slammed, and bang, 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 and he came running into the, dad, 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 something amazing has happened, something amazing has happened. He sort of shoved his iPhone in my face. I go, what is it, mum? No, 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 mum's okay, so it's me. Something's happened to me. I said, what's happened to you? He says, look, 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 and I sort of couldn't quite see. Guess what's happened? I said, what's happened? I got one and a half million likes, one and a half million likes. What have you done? What, what do you mean? Who likes you? He said, well, that picture we made in Ikea, I posted it. 
and I wrote underneath the perks of being bald and bored in Ikea. And every, I've put it on nine gag, the sort of worldwide humor site. It's incredible. I've become famous. I've become famous. And nobody in my school has ever posted anything with so many likes. And I said, yeah, but what are we going to do? And he got on his knees. Now, this is spectacular. He said, Dad, please, I'm asking you a favor. Can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? I said, yeah, sure. How can I help? He said, tomorrow night I've invited my whole class to come for supper because I said that you and I are going to teach them how they can post and get as liked on like. They won't succeed as well as we've done, will they? But we'll, we'll show them. I said, sure, sure. So the next night, these 30 kids came. And we all ended up spending the evening around the table. And I thought it was the most magnificent way, much the same way as at the beginning, sort of indirect sort of peeing your pants, that you end up in this very strange situation, finding a way to make contact. OK, we're getting there slowly. Um, so am I going to spend the rest of my life running around the world with bog brushes attached to my head? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but what's ha or sticking them on other people's heads. But what's actually happened is quite beautiful, and a, a sort of a dream is coming true. Going back to that story of my childhood being lost, indirectly finding a form of connection, I want to share that with others. And since the launch of the project, we get thousands of emails every day saying, I want to do what you do. I want to travel. I want to see. I want to connect. I want to show. I want to celebrate. The sort of generation and millennials really truly believe in a very different wealth of existence. So we've set up a charity. Uh, not so long ago, and it's about enabling other younger people to go off into the world, and at the same time, it's documenting and seeing the world and celebrating the world that still exists in all its in authenticity and also finding themselves. And here's a short film to talk about it. We're all people. We're all essentially the same, and whether we're black or white, we've got long hair or no hair, we wear a turban on our head and we dance backwards around the fire. We're all the same people. We all must feel the same, we have the same emotions. We love, we laugh, we cry, we hug, we're desperate, we celebrate. The Jimmy Nelson Foundation, is, it's, it's a kaleidoscope, it's a celebration, it's a rainbow of individuality, it's a rainbow of expression, it's a rainbow of people, it's a rainbow of individuals who feel something. And through that feeling, in this case, of their culture, they want to show and share. So I really hope the Jimmy Nelson Foundation is very simply a catalyst of, of creative people being sent off into the world to see, to share, to feel, and to bring back a sort of a creative expression of what's still out there. I want to go off into the world and say, look, do what I do, feel what I feel. It's out of this world. It has to be a catalyst for the indigenous cultures themselves to realize how precious they are, how extraordinary they are, how beautiful they are, and how little of it is still left, and how valuable it is to us today. I want to show the world that through this communication, through this extraordinary heritage that we still have, perhaps we can sort of readdress of how we actually look at each other and sort of readdress that pride. How can you help? Okay, two more pictures. <laughs> the last ones only happened a few days ago. I'll get there in a minute. Um, this is, in many ways, this is also a selfie. This is of uh, Yuri and the Yamal. He's a part of the Nenet tribe. And I remember sort of showing this to a colleague of mine, and she said, oh, Jimmy, when you finish your talks, you have to show that picture of Yuri. She said, it's one of my favorites. And I said, well, I don't understand. She said, well, it's a picture of you. I said, what do you mean it's a picture of me? She said, well, look, you're reflected in his eyes. And when you print this very big, there's this very, very sharp reflection of this sort of Mr. Bean-esque character waving and screaming and crying and freezing behind his tripod. She said, that's what this is. It's a metaphor. You've sort of etched yourselves into their identity. And by showing and sharing this picture, I want to invert it and etch something on you this morning. It's just a few pictures, just a few stories. I don't have the answers. Since 17, I haven't studied anything. But I do feel there's something very, very important about these people and these cultures. And it's something that we have to keep discussing and cherishing and wondering why they're so special before they disappear. And the last picture, this is something I only put in a couple of days ago. This is about my son again. My wife, a, w a week ago, she said, have you, have you seen Narush? This is his name. And I go, yeah, what do you mean? She said, you better go down into his room and see what he's done to himself. And I go, oh, no, what's he done to himself now? So I went down into his room, and he's sort of sitting on his bed very sheepishly. And he looks up at me, and um, here he is. And, <laughs> and I sort of looked at him, and I went, <gasps> and I sort of opened my mouth, and he raised his finger, and he went, Dad, remember what you say in your stories. Authenticity, individuality. Be 
careful what you're about to say to me. <laughs> and you know, I didn't say a word. I went, and I walked away. Thank you. Uh, oh. We're going to do something. Um, can we turn on the lights? Can everybody stand up? Uh, to honor being here today, uh, you're my tribe. So I want to make a picture of you, but it's a very special picture. You have to stand very tall, raise your chin, chest out, choose your best side, yeah? groin out, whatever it is. <laughs> Remember to a half an hour ago, stand tall. Everybody ready? Okay, I need some help. Okay, I'm going to join in with you, yeah? Okay, we're going to make two. Okay, it's a panoramic, yeah? Whoops, yeah, that's why I took my shoes off. Okay, okay. You ready? Everybody ready? Breathe in, be proud, be strong, be the tribe. One more, a bit slower. It has to be a bit slower. Yeah. Thank you. 